Christmas is right around the corner, and since I know a lot of you are gonna be getting some gift money today, I put together three budget gaming PC bill guides so you know exactly what to do with that money. Let's get into it. Hey, welcome to Zach's Tech Turf. So yeah, today we're gonna be putting together three budget gaming PC build guides, a $500 build, a $750 build, and a $1,000 build. But I need to start with a quick disclaimer that this is honestly like the worst time to be building a gaming PC. As we all already know, this holiday season has been a disaster in terms of stock for all sorts of electronics. And even though there have been some seriously impressive hardware launches over the last six months, it's nearly impossible to actually get a hold of anything. I'm gonna do my best to only pick parts that are in stock. I'll have easy Amazon links down in the description for those of you that are ready to purchase right now. But before all that though, a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Corsair and specifically their new Qatar Pro wireless gaming mouse, which is such a great option for both me and my audience that's looking for that super clean price to performance gaming mouse. The Qatar Pro wireless connects with either Bluetooth or Corsair's own slipstream wireless technology using the USB dongle. It's powered by a single AA battery, which lasts around 100 and 35 hours. It's super lightweight at only 96 grams. And the best part is it only costs $39.99. This symmetric and clean shape is perfect for gamers with claw and fingertip grips. And there's two buttons on the left hand side and even an on the fly DPI button in the middle. It's also powered by Corsair's IQ software for the ultimate customization. And you can get one for yourself by clicking that first link down in the description. Now for all three of these build guides today, I actually went down the Intel route because of all the AMD Ryzen chips virtually being out of stock or at crazy high prices, Intel actually beats the price to performance in all three of these price categories. I'm also only going to be including parts that are in stock at either B&H, Amazon, or Newegg. Those three websites are the most reliable in my opinion, and pretty much everyone in the United States at least has access to them. Now I'm only gonna be having Amazon links down in the description, and that's purely just to make all of this affiliate linking easier. I do get a small kickback by the way, but I 100% recommend you doing your due diligence and using as many websites as you possibly can to get the best possible price on each individual component. I'm almost done rambling, but also please don't be upset if you find something in this video that's out of stock. Most of the items here can be swapped out for something that's in stock. And for example, if I pick like an MSI GTX 1660 Super Gaming X graphics card, just know that you could easily swap that out for nearly any GTX 1660 Super that you can get your hands on. Your build doesn't need to match these build guides 100%. I would have also started with a cheaper build for today, like a $350 or a $400 build guide, but for those cheaper systems, I would really only recommend a Ryzen APU, and since all of those are at such high prices right now, we have to start with the $500 build. Speaking of which, this here is the $500 system, and oh boy, this was certainly a tough one to make with these stock issues. Starting with the CPU, this here is the Intel i3-10100F, which is four cores and eight threads with a max turbo frequency of 4.3 gigahertz. Honestly, there's not a ton of options here, possibly the 9100F if it's not at a ridiculously high price as well, but this one should work out pretty well for you. You can also choose to use the budget cooler that this CPU comes with, and that should work fine for you for now. The motherboard I paired it with is simply just the cheapest micro ATX LGA 1200 model that I can find with four RAM slots, and this is the Gigabyte B460M DS3H. The DS3H line of motherboards for both Intel and AMD have been rock solid as budget options, and I've used them in so many build guides. If you're following this build, it's really important to get one with four RAM slots because at this $500 budget, I could only fit in the this Corsair Vengeance LPX 2x4 gigabyte kit clocked at 3000 megahertz. This is a really nice set of RAM and you can definitely upgrade with another eight gigabyte kit to get you up to 16 gigabytes in the future. But unfortunately, I just couldn't squeeze in 16 gigabytes. Keep in mind that most people shopping don't have a 100% super strict only $500 build. If you have a little bit of wiggle room then I would definitely recommend just upgrading to a two by eight gigabyte kit now so you have 16 gigabytes. Moving down the list, we have storage. And this here is just the cheapest M.2 drive that I could find. Fine. It's the MS30 from Team Group at 512 gigabytes. It does not have DRAM or the NVMe speeds, but even these SATA speeds will be plenty fast for most people. And that's a good amount of space for just a $500 new build. Moving along here, we have the GPU. And now this choice I'm actually pretty happy with. I saw that there's this MSI GTX 1650 Gaming X graphics card still available at B&H. But once again, just go with any GTX 1650 that you can get your hands on. Pairing a 1650 with a 10100F is actually some stupid value for just a $500 system. System, you can play any game in 
1080p, I would guess mostly at medium settings for the higher demanding AAA titles, but then for like eSport titles, you should be able to get like 1080p high to very high. Next up we get to the case, and now nobody freak out, but I'm actually going to recommend, well not really recommend, but select the HEC HX210, which is micro ATX, and I actually featured this in a previous $300 used gaming PC build guide, and I definitely said that I hated working inside this case. To be honest, it's just difficult to build in here, they don't make it easy on us, but once the build is complete, it actually looks pretty decent. It doesn't come with intake fans, but most people have some 120 millimeter black fans laying around somewhere, and if you don't, just buy a cheap three pack of RGB fans to put two of them up at the front like I did with this $300 build. And finally, just like my other gaming PC build guides, the power supply I chose specifically is this EVGA W3 450 watt unit, which I would recommend picking up from EVGA's B-Stock website, but honestly, just go with any of the $25 to $35 options that you can find on there. Like I've said so many times at this point, on Wednesdays, EVGA drops midweek madness with a ton of good power supply deals, and with the prices being so low, that is just such a reliable source of power supplies that I can't really recommend buying a new one at this point. Do keep in mind that you very well might go to that EVGA B-Stock website and find that there's no good deals right at this very second, but if you show some patience, hopefully over the next week or two, there will be some good deals over there. With that being said, here's what the final parts list is looking like again, and although this will come out to a bit over our $500 mark, honestly, that 10 100F and 1650 are gonna provide some pretty solid price performance that I'm definitely happy enough to recommend, especially considering the status of today's market. Now, next up, we have the $750 build guide, and I'm happy to say that, honestly, pretty much every single part gets upgraded compared to the $500 build, and not just like the graphics card, and this one provides some great value as well. Once again, everything is linked down in the description, starting with the CPU. Now we have the Intel i5 10400F, which definitely gets a nice bump up in performance as it's rocking six cores and 12 threads with the max turbo 4.3 gigahertz, just like the 10100F. This is not an overclockable chip, but that means we don't need to spend a ton of money on the motherboard. And for this, I got the Asus Prime B460M, which is rocking a pretty nice white and black color scheme, two M.2 ports, and most importantly, those four RAM slots. Speaking of which, I went with my good old trusty YOLO 16 gigabyte kit, which is clocked at 3000 megahertz. And I've been using these RAM sticks in so many of my build guides lately, and you just can't go wrong with them. They're usually sitting around $50, but lately have been creeping up around that $60 mark, which is honestly really scary, so just keep an eye on that. Another go-to pick that I select a lot is the SSD, and this is the Crucial P1 at 500 gigabytes. This is definitely an upgrade from the MS30 from the $500 build, as it's rocking NVMe speeds and DRAM, and this one has been such a consistent go-to option for me, because its price is always around that same $60 mark, and it performs really well. One thing to keep in mind, which is actually pretty surprising, however, at the time of making this video, the Samsung 970 Evo at 500 gigabytes is actually also at $60, and man, this is a crazy nice SSD for the price. I would personally go with the 970 if it's at that price when you're watching, but I have no idea how long that deal will last. Moving on, we get to the GPU, and I actually did manage to find an EVGA GTX 1660 Super SC Ultra graphics card available on Amazon. Just like the pair with the $500 build, this 1660 Super paired with the 10400F will be a crazy nice combination for gaming, and this really hits the sweet spot for a $750 system. Usually around this price point in previous build guides, I've been recommending something like the Ryzen 5 with the 1660 Super, but since the Ryzen 5s are nowhere to be found at normal prices, this is indeed a really nice option that I would actually have no problem recommending. If you're looking to see the 10400F's performance a bit more, I did feature that in a previous ITX build that I did a few months ago, which you can check out in the upper right hand corner. Following that though, we get to the case, and this is the Cooler Master Masterbox MB320L. I've also used this one before, and at $45, this is just a lot of case for the money. It has some decent airflow with the vents up at the front. It includes two ARGB fans, so you don't have to worry about that. And just as a reminder, these case selections are always more subjective than anything, so just go with any case around that $40 to $50 mark that you personally like. I would, however, recommend that case being micro ATX. It's not the end of the world if you pair a full-size ATX case with a micro ATX motherboard. It just doesn't look that great, so I would personally recommend just making sure both of them are micro ATX. And finally, the last part is another PSU from B-Stock. This time I selected the EVGA 500BR because this one is a bit better rated up there at tier C with all black cables. This one usually sits for around $30, but once again, just go with any of the models that you can find on there around this price point. And finally, here's what the completed parts list is looking like for the $750 system. In my opinion, this one might just be the best price and performance build that I have today, but let's move on to that $1,000 system because that one is pretty baller as well. This one again is getting mostly all upgrades from the $750 system, but not quite every single part. Just like the other two, let's start with the CPU. Once again, this is a step up as this is the Intel 
10600K, which is also six cores and 12 threads like the 10400F, but this one has much higher frequencies like that boost clock at 4.8 gigahertz, and it's also overclockable if you wanna try and get even more performance out of it. If you are interested in overclocking, you're gonna need a CPU cooler. You also just need one in general because it doesn't come with one unlike our previous two choices, and I simply decided to go with the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black Edition, which usually sits for just above $30. To overclock, you're also gonna need a proper Z490 motherboard, and that's where this full-size ATX ASRock Z490 Phantom 4 model comes into play, and this will set you back around 150 bucks, which is kinda steep. This was the cheapest Z490 motherboard that I could personally find, and I would only recommend spending this much money on it if you do plan to overclock that 10600K. Keep in mind that this entire $1,000 system would pair perfectly fine with the much cheaper 10400F and a cheaper motherboard, and you could definitely go down that route if you want to. Moving along here, we get to the RAM, and believe it or not, this is the first RGB kit in my video today. This is the 2x8GB Team T-Force Delta Tough Kit clocked at 3,200 megahertz, and to be honest, I really only chose this because it's from a reputable brand with RGB. There's some decent money to be saved if you don't want RGB, but I think it's safe to say that most people buying a $1,000 system are buying RGB RAM these days. Next up, the Crucial P1 takes the SSD slot for this system as well, although here I squeeze in a one terabyte model, which is obviously much better. I already explained why I love the P1 so much, but also just to reiterate, keep an eye out for that Samsung 970 Evo popping up around for that same price point. Following that, we get to the GPU, and now this is definitely the most dreaded choice out of all three of these build guides today. I selected another EVGA GTX 1660 Super SE Ultra Edition just because it was in stock, but man, this is a really tough recommendation. In a perfect world, I would have loved to shoot for a better graphics card or at least a different 1660 Super than the one single one that's in stock at the time of making this video. So don't think of this as a recommendation, but rather just a placeholder for whatever GPU you think is the best for your build or whatever GPU is actually in stock when you're buying a PC. Honestly, one recommendation that you could run with is simply to buy something cheaper like a GTX 1650, maybe even something cheaper on the used market if you're feeling confident, and then use one of those cheaper options as a temporary placeholder until you can upgrade to something that just came out like an RTX 3060 Ti, RTX 3070, or even one of those new AMD cards that are all nowhere to be found. The great thing about this $1,000 system is that it could easily be upgraded to a $1,250 or $1,500 system simply by upgrading to a beefier GPU. That 10600K can definitely be paired with a higher end graphics card. So that is why I would actually recommend going down this temporary GPU placeholder route. Gaming on this system with something like a GTX 1650 will certainly not be the most balanced build for right now. But in a few months, when you can get your hands on a much beefier graphics card, you'll definitely be thankful for your incredibly powerful gaming PC. We do need to finish up this parts list, however, and next up is the case, and I went with the Corsair 4000X RGB ATX mid-tower simply because I wanted to go with something brand new and make it nice and fresh. The 4000X does cost $120, which is pretty steep, and you can certainly drop the price much lower than that if you want to, but this does come with three RGB fans, so you should be set for the actual aesthetics of this build with just that. Another option I recommend doing is if you want to target better cooling and airflow is to go with the Corsair 4000D airflow model, which is much cheaper, and then simply pair that with like some up here RGB fans that'll give you some much better cooling. And finally, to wrap up the $1,000 gaming PC, we have the power supply. I didn't want to go with a used EVGA B stock for a $1,000 build, to be honest, although you definitely would be fine in doing so. So I picked up this new Cooler Master Master Watt 550 watt, which is bronze certified rocking all black cables. You don't necessarily need to go with this specific model. I would go with any 500 to 600 watt power supply from a reputable brand like EVGA, Corsair, Thermaltake, and a few others that you can find a good deal on. Also, if you're thinking about going down that temporary GPU route, don't cheap out on the power supply now, and instead, I would recommend getting something like a $600 to a $700 power supply, and that'll take you through your future GPU upgrade. With that being said, here's what the final parts list is looking like for the $1,000 system, and this was definitely the toughest one in the group. The reason why you haven't been seeing more expensive build guides like this on my channel lately is because all of the expensive GPUs are out of stock, and you'll need to use a creative solution like I was mentioning today. If you want to see these build guides all side by side, here you go as well. Despite the market troubles, I'm actually pretty happy with these, and even if you just use these as a reference point and don't get the exact same components, they will all provide you with a great gaming experience with also some room to upgrade them. Do keep in mind that if anything on the market changes here soon, all three of these CPUs could be swapped out with something like a Ryzen 3 or Ryzen 5 chips, but you'll obviously need to swap out your motherboard choices for those as well. Now, I have a feeling a lot of you are interested in more of that $500 build guide, so click that video that's on the screen now, and that'll take you to my latest actual $500 build where I built it, benchmarked it, and showed the performance and everything. But as always, I hope you enjoyed this video.